On this episode of What the Ship, the Royal Thai Navy is searching for crew members from a sunken corvette. The port of L.A. and Long Beach have ended their container dwell fee that they never intended to implement. Germany is building LNG facilities at breakneck speed. The Australian government issues a report on the loss of containers from APL England. And we go breaking bad on this episode with how a cocaine smuggling cartel infiltrated the world's biggest shipping company. Holy cow, that's a lot of news to go over right there. And it covers the spectrum of the maritime community. I'm your host, Alan McCoglano. Welcome to today's episode. So we do What the Ship Weekly. We have other features we do on an almost every other day basis on what's going on with shipping. But this is our really our kind of the flagship here where we do our weekly summary, 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 summary of news across the board and pick five stories that I think will cover them for you today. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a second, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's jump into story number one. All right, story number one is a tragic story. This is the story of a Thai Navy Corvette that has sunk out in the Gulf of Thailand. This story from Reuters really covers it. The Thai government has deployed uh, assets out looking for survivors from this, including 33 mariners who are missing. They say Marines, but I, I think they mean mariners or sailors. They're missing from a Corvette that sank overnight in choppy water. Three vessels, two helicopters are out there trying to find the, the survivors of the vessel, the, uh, his Thai Majesty's ship, Sukhothai. I'm not sure if I said that right. Uh, the warship suffered an engine malfunction and went down just before midnight, about 20 miles off the coast. There's actually a video here of the vessel in its uh, situation kind of healing over there. So how does a engine malfunction lead to this? Well, engines, diesel engines, gas turbine engines, all engines have to take water into the ship for cooling purposes. So there are always intakes from the ocean into the interior of the ship. And if one of those hoses coming in, if, if, if a mounting, a fitting, or something blows, you can very quickly begin to flood the vessel. And it doesn't take much, particularly in a warship, to flood the vessel and to get it in a situation where it can capsize and sink. And that's basically what has happened here with the warship. This was a ship that had been built in the United States for the Thai government. Uh, the ship went over very quickly. And again, ships, especially warships like this, these ships don't have very much margin here in terms of stability. They're usually in a pretty fully loaded condition most of the time with ammunition, with fuel, everything on board. And so stability is always an issue here. And once you get a leak, especially in an engine room, if you can't control it very quickly, engine rooms tend to be the largest compartments on vessels, on warships particularly, not on other ships, on, on, on cargo ships, it's cargo capacity. But on warships, it's the engine compartment. And if that engine compartment floods, num first of all, you, you, you lose your stability, you start getting a massive list has happened in this, but more importantly, you, you may lose your ability to pump the water out because you've lost power, unless you have auxiliary engines and auxiliary machinery to do this. So a very precarious position. I think this is also one of the issues why it's very leery for us to see full autonomy unmanned vessels out on the high seas. If you've ever watched any episode of the Deadliest Catch, every periodically they'll have an episode where something's going on, they start flooding in the engine room, and the crew have to get down there in a very quick manner and deal with it because a pinhole leak on a ship will sink it. That's all it takes. And for ships to operate, they have to be taking seawater in and turning it into cooling water and fresh water. It's just the common process that has to be done. So uh, we are, of course, thinking for the best for this crew as search goes on for them out in the Gulf of Thailand. All right. Story number two. I'm going to get a little bit fired up on this one here a bit. The Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach to end container dwell fee they never implemented. My buddy Mike Schuller over at G-Captain wrote this story. I just want to highlight something here real quick for this story. The program was announced October 25th, October 25th, 2021. So we're talking about not just this past October, we're talking about over a year ago at the height of last year's holiday shipping season to help combat the huge backlog of containers that had built up at Los Angeles and Long Beach. 
under the temporary policy developed in coordination, in coordination with the Biden-Harris Supply Chain Disruptions Task Force, U.S. Department of Transportation, and multiple supply chain stakeholders, ocean carriers could be charged a compounding daily fee for each import container dwelling nine days or more at the marine terminal. But fee implementation has been postponed by both ports since the start of the program, and no money has ever been collected. Okay, time out. First off, I got to say, this was the biggest bull ever by the ports of LA and Long Beach. So let's be clear what, what this, this story is, is right here. So when ports of LA and Long Beach had their record number of ships sitting off the port and they were chocker blocked, log jammed with containers, they came up with this idea of a basically a, a, a form of what I called hyper demurrage that they're going to charge. So this compounding daily fee. So if you go over nine days, you're going to be charged $800 for a container. So if that, that container is on the, on the terminal for day 10, you ain't get paid. You have to charge hundred dollars. If it's there for day 11, you get charged the original hundred dollars you had. Plus now the fee doubles to $200 or adds a hundred to it. So now you're charged $300. And if it's there the next day, you're charged $300 plus the new fee, which goes up another $100. That's now $600. So uh, within a very short period of time, you're going to be paying more in demerge fees for that container than probably the container is loaded and worth. And let me be clear. Number one, this is illegal. I'm sorry. There's no way the Federal Maritime Commission would ever allow this form of demerge to go on. Because at the same time this is going on, the Federal Maritime Commission is investigating demerge. They're in, investigating detention demerge. There's a whole finding going on here where the Federal Maritime Commission is basically al alleging that terminals and shipping companies were imposing fees on shippers that were well beyond what was considered normal. This is it. Now, this demerge right here was in coordination with the Harris, the Biden-Harris Supply Chain Disruptions Task Force. The, the, uh, I, 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 I can't even, so on one hand, the federal government, the Biden-Harris Supply Chain Task Force is basically saying, yeah, yeah, charge hyper demerge. On the other hand, the Federal Maritime Commission, which is made up of five commissioners appointed by the U.S. government, certified by or uh, affirmed by the U.S. Senate is probably saying, no, you can't do that. The mixed message that was coming out of here was insane. But even that nonsense doesn't go to this level of nonsense. Number one, every week, every Monday, they postponed this thing. They never implemented this thing, never put it in. They kept saying they were, they kept threatening they were, but they didn't. And so it was never implemented. But the other aspect was this. Prior to all this craziness where the port was, again, chocker blocked with containers, the port of L.A. and Long Beach basically made agreements with shippers to allow them to keep their containers in the terminal free for much longer than nine days. And this is the problem that kept coming back to bite L.A. and Long Beach in the butt is that they had agreements with some shippers to basically allow this. And it wasn't L.A. and Long Beach. It was the terminals that had this. So how do you charge a hyper-demerge fee on one shipper, but not on another shipper? That was the problem that they always had. So they could never implement this. Even though they kept saying they were, even though they kept saying that they were going to use this, they never did. And by the way, the thing that eventually cleared up part of the logjam was the fact that things slowed down. It had nothing to do with this demerge. Now, interesting uh, enough, New York, New Jersey, Savannah, and Houston have implemented their own versions of this, but they're much more measured, they're much more targeted, and they avoid this issue of this kind of just flamethrower of demerge charges that this was going to impose. And I got to say, to me, that was an indication way back when that L.A. and Long Beach really weren't on top of the situation as well as they did. This idea seemed very draconian. It seemed like it was designed to instill fear. It wasn't meant to actually clear containers out of the terminal. And what are we seeing now? Well, you look at the news right now, and what you see is this. Cargo slowdown continues at the Port of Los Angeles. I have been extremely hard on the Port of Los Angeles and Gene Soroka. I don't think I'm one of Gene's very favorite people. But let me be clear, during the height of the supply chain crisis, Gene was on every time, every day, I, I mean, just nonstop. He was the face of the supply chain, the ports. And one of the things that I was concerned about 
was that LA and Long Beach were being the measuring blocks for us to determine how well this is going. And that was a false narrative because one of the things we saw happening behind the scenes was cargo was slowly beginning to shift out of LA and Long Beach to other ports. All the actions taken by LA Long Beach and by AB5 in California, by the shift in drayage that's going to outlaw a whole batch of short haul trucking come January 1st, the issue with the labor negotiation between the ILWU and the PMA, there was a myriad of issues. Oh, the train strike, uh, train uh, pending stri- train strike, the Union Pacific trains being looted, and again, they were not looted. The, the, the thievery and robbery was not on a grand scale, but it was enough to cause problems. And what people have begun to do is ship their cargo closer to the population center. They'd rather pay more, ship their cargo longer, than take the chance of going into L.A. and Long Beach, the cargo getting stuck in the terminal, not getting out on time, and then it still has to be railed halfway across the country because two-thirds of all the cargo to go into L.A. and Long Beach go to the eastern half of the United States, not the western half. And that's what we're seeing here. And the fact that L.A. and Long Beach now, now, are sitting there saying, hey, we're going to get rid of the hyper-demerge, which, by the way, can I be clear, my favorite story ever about doing this channel was talking to someone who said to me specifically that, oh, by the way, the administration doesn't like it when you call it hyper-demerge. That was my favorite day ever doing this channel. The fact that the administration didn't like something I was doing, too bad. That's, That's what it was. That's the exact term of what to call that monstrosity that L.A. and Long Beach were going to implement. To give you the graphics of how this has changed, let's go over to some stories here by uh, Greg Miller. And he captures uh, right here the the image of what happens to the imports into the United States in terms of containers. This chart shows you that decline. So the purple chart right there shows you the total import volume of TEUs, this 20-foot equivalent units, into the United States, again, for the first half of 2022, It was a record year. If you look up here, look how it was much higher, bigger than 2021. And then come right after the summer, right after August, it begins to drop. Plateaus there for about a month before Christmas and then continues its decline, getting back down to around 2019 numbers. Now, 2022 will still be a record year in terms of container volumes into the United States. But what you're seeing here is that drastic fall. It's even more so if you look at the ports. This is the port of Los Angeles. So again, start of the year 2022, it was rivaling what you saw in 2021. And then after March, you see it dips down below those 2021 numbers, peaks a little bit in July, and then straight down. And matter of fact, it is below 2019, 2018 levels for the Port of LA and then the Port of Long Beach, the same thing. You can see how those West Coast ports are really losing out in terms of container volume. So Big thing for LA and Long Beach to finally remove this thing that was never going to be implemented. It was a joke for a long time. It really was. And, and I think LA and Long Beach were, were should have said this a long time ago. You know, the threat of hyperdemerge sitting there was was number again, another thing that did not need to be there. If you want to get shipping back, you know, there was a, a few months ago I had a story where LA and Long Beach was asking to get their containers back, and yet they still had this crazy thing hanging over them, it just, again, I think it's poor management at that point. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to story number three. Story number three comes in from GCAP and Reuters story. Breakneck LNG build-out shows Germany can move fast. So you want to talk about an issue that's really interesting. So all of a sudden, Russia is not getting, uh, excuse me, Russian natural gas is not flowing into Europe, which means Europe has got to get liquefied natural gas. Now, understand you just can't pump in liquefied natural gas, comes in ships, but you need regasification processes, uh, uh, places to pump natural gas into the system. But you got to turn it from a liquid, which is chilled to minus 270 degrees Fahrenheit, about one negative 165 Celsius. And so that takes facilities, which are usually these portable facilities, these regasification units, these tankers that take the gas and uh, excuse me, take the liquid and turn it into gas. Well, Germany is up and running in building these new facilities ashore in record time. And you see that right here. The speed with which Germany managed to build and link its first floating gas terminal to replace lost supplies of Russian gas should serve as a model for a new, pacier German economy, according to Chancellor Olaf Scholz said at the terminal's opening. Germany, again, let's not forget, Germany, one of the top five economies on the planet. 
And there's a reason for that. And you see that right here with the ability of Germany to get a regasification facility up and running. Go over here. Europe is filling up on diesel cargoes as Russian sanctions near. So Europe is basically monopolizing and actually cornering the diesel market out there. Because they're not getting diesel from Russia anymore, they're taking diesel off the market. As a matter of fact, when you look at this story here, you see where they're getting it from. The overwhelming majority of non-Russian uh, deliveries of diesel fuel into the UK and EU are coming from the Middle East and Asia, including Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and India. More en route, including a super tanker that recently loaded at least some diesel in the Middle East and is now sailing for Rotterdam, Russia's primary non-EU diesel buyer is Turkey, which is also an export. Now remember, Russian crude oil cannot be imported into the EU anymore. However, if you take that Russian crude, take it to a secondary country, turn it into diesel fuel, it's clean. It's perfect. It's, you can bring it in. And this is one of the reasons why we see diesel shortages for quite a long time here in the United States, particularly in the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast, because that diesel that was sitting there in tanks in the New England and Mid-Atlantic was worth a heck of a lot more over in Europe. And fuel speculators were pulling it out of the United States, hauling it over there, selling that diesel, and then screaming, hey, there's no diesel here in the United States. What's going on? It's got to be an issue with things like, I don't know, the Jones Act or the Colonial Pipeline. And instead, what we see is energy speculators moving diesel around the world to where they can sell it at the highest price, which is, again, what they're going to do. And then finally, this story, Russia sets up Baltic Sea ship-to-ship -ship terminal for tankers. So Russia is setting up, now normally Russian tankers in the Baltic were delivering crude oil and diesel product to Europe. Well, that's not the case anymore. So they were typically using very small tankers for that in the Baltic. Plus, they were using ice strengthened tankers because of winter in the Baltic. Now, they have to set up this facility, this ship-to-ship -ship terminal, where they can pump that oil into larger tankers to take it worldwide. And this is being set up. This is a big danger, again, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is environmental issues, spills, but it's also going to increase the cost of fuel oil because now that oil has to be shipped a longer distance. It comes back to that issue I talk about all the time, ton miles. Not just the matter of tons you, you sell, but the miles you ship those tons. And that is a big issue. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to story number four. Story number four deals with the issue, it's raining containers. And I mean literally raining containers off container ships. This story comes to us from Australia, where the Australian government just finished an investigation into the loss of containers last year off the APL England. So quick note, if you look at this ship now, APL England lost, uh, it was under 100 containers. But notice something on the stern there. Notice how those containers on the stern are kind of split into a V formation. Some are listing to the port side, some are rolled to the starboard side. And all the way up forward here, you'll see another stack that's kind of sticking off right here. This is classic parametric rolling right here. The containers didn't all roll to one side, they've rolled to multiple sides. And this is because of the twisting of the vessel. So this story right here from Mike Schuller, APL England cargo loss, ship fit, ship's fittings found in poor condition. If we go right over here to the report by the Australian Transport Safety Bureau, again, this took place off the coast of Sydney, Australia, back in May of 2020. Excuse me, I said last year, it was 2020 it took place. Let me just summarize here what the ATSB found. Uh, the ATSB found that APL England's fixed container securing arrangements on deck were in a poor state of repair, and the strength of the many securing fixtures was severely reduced by corrosion. In the seas and counters, the fittings failed and the containers were lost overboard. The investigation also found that this container would have taken several years of poor maintenance to develop, so it just didn't happen overnight. This showed the ship had not received the scrutiny from crew members, shore management, or other agencies that a ship of its age or condition required. This presented an increased risk to the continued safe operation of the vessel security of the cargo carried and safety of the crew members working around the containers. Remember, we've seen cargo break loose in containers. We've seen containers come loose that have resulted in fires on board ships, Zim Kingston, uh, Express Pearl, and actually involved the loss of vessels that had huge impact on the environment of regions, Express Pearl off the coast of Sri Lanka. 
In addition, the investigators found that procedures for adverse weather was not followed. Had these procedures and associated assessment tools been used, navigational operational dimensions could have been made, which would have been prepared for the ship and the conditions occurred. So two things here. Number one, the fittings used to lock the containers in place were in poor condition. They degraded, not over a short period of time, but a long period of time. That should have been caught during periodic shipboard inspections by both the Port Safety Control and the Classification Society, but it wasn't. And that gives you an indication, the fact that there are things that are slipping through the cracks. And instances like this were probably responsible for the container collapse on board ships like APL Vanda that required that vessel to go off its chartered course and sit in Djibouti for a long period of time. If APL, which is owned by CMA CGM, is not doing this, guarantee other companies are not doing it. The other issue there is that weather diversion. If you know you're heading into high seas and you could subject the ship to parametric rolling, you should divert. You should divert around weather. However, ships are leery to do that because they want to get on their berth at their assigned time. They don't want to pay for being late and they don't want to lose their berth to get their containers off because they have to keep their schedule. All that comes in this story right here from Lodestar. Uh, crew feared for the safety during Trans-Pacific Voyage on unseaworthy container ship. Crew aboard the Zim Iberia have written to their crewing agents asking for redeployment after they claimed they, quote, feared for their safety as they crossed the Pacific in an, quote, unquote, unseaworthy ship. 4,256 TEU vessel under a Hamburg-based uh, Hamania Rideri sailed from Busan for Vancouver on 3 November with, according to a report, two of its four auxiliary engines out of commission and a third operating at about half power. So not a good material condition for a ship to be in. And again, one of the things we're seeing is we're operating ships at high volume, high capacity during the supply chain. Now that we're out of this, now that ships are slowing down, we're blank sailing. Now's the point where we should be reassessing that fleet. The port state uh, officials should be inspecting vessels, determining seaworthiness of the vessels. Classification societies should be doing this. And this should all be led by the International Maritime Organization, the IMO. This is the problem you have in a lot of registries and a lot of classification societies. And because of the scope and scale of the number of vessels that are moving and the pace of this, it's hard to do this. And what we're seeing is accidents. And that's what causes the loss of life. All right, let's go to our last story. All right, this last story is a great story. It is my Breaking Bad analogy. Now, I've been talking about this since 2019 when it first happened. But Bloomberg just ran a huge expose on this and it is a great story. And if you can get it and look at it, you should. How a cocaine smuggling cartel infiltrated the world's biggest shipping company. As MSC grew into a dominant force in global trade, it also became the prime drug trafficking conduit for Balkan gangs. This story, the intro is great. In the summer of 2019, Claudio Bozo, again, you can't get better names than they have in these stories, chief operating officer of MSC Mediterranean Shipping Company, flew 4,000 miles from Geneva to Washington for a meeting with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. He'd been sent by MSC's owner, a secretive 82-year-old billionaire named John Luigi Aponte, to contain a crisis. So first of all, let's be clear about something. Mediterranean Shipping Company is a great company, uh, but you can't buy into MSC because it's a family business. It is owned by a single family, the Aponte family. And this is, uh, if, if, if you want classic shipping stories, the Aponte one is a great one. Uh, Mediterranean Shipping, which is a long company, been out there for a long time, owned MSC Cargo, MSC Cruises. Uh, they, they, they were the owners of the Achille Laurel back in the day. Uh, they are now the largest ocean carrier in terms of containers in the world. They have bought every container ship they can get their hands on, and now they are the largest. But this story deals with the sh one ship in particular, the MSC Guyane, that pulled into the port of Philadelphia. And this is it. I am not going to tell you the whole story because you really need to... Read this story from Bloomberg, listen to it, or head over to The Big Take, which is a podcast, and you can listen to it. I'll have it in the show notes, and you can listen to it. It is a great story. But anyway, coming back over here. Sorry, I went a little bit too far there. There we go. So uh, a few months earlier, more than 100 agents had boarded the MSC Guyana as it slid into the port of Philadelphia for what was supposed to be a quick stop on its way to Rotterdam. 
deep below deck, hitting in container packed with wine and nuts. The agents discover nearly, hang on, 20 tons of cocaine worth $1 billion. The ensuing investigation showed that more than a third of the crew, almost all from Montenegro, uh, from the Balkans, all MSC employees had helped transfer vast amounts of cocaine from speedboats at night while the ship powered through the open ocean off South America. It was the largest maritime drug bust in American history. I have a brother who's a police officer, and he would tell me about drug busts, and I always tell him you can't compare to the MSC guy in. 20 tons, tons of cocaine. This is what got caught, by the way. Can you imagine what doesn't get caught? My favorite thing about this story is not just that they caught these guys and they, they rolled them and, and they started ratting on each other like crazy. Not the fact that they loaded this out of speedboats onto the ship and had to pack it in the containers and then take it out of containers and repack it in the containers. That's not my favorite part. My favorite part is when Customs and Border Patrol came on board, they seized the vessel and threatened to sell it off in auction as a drug vehicle, much like you would sell off the car of a drug uh, dealer. And in my opinion, let me be clear, CBP wussed out. They wussed out big time because they didn't sell this vessel and they should have because MSC was complacent in this. The fact that they let their crew members do this, crew members they had hired, the chief officer was involved in this. They, this is something that they should have been aware of and they weren't. And that is massive disregard in my opinion. So there's some great quotes in this story. And again, you got to read the story. It's just, I, I don't have the time to do it. Maybe I'll do a, a separate video on this because it's so good. But this quote right here, the story the crew told about hoisting five elephants worth of cocaine off speedboats seemed far-fetched. Really, you think? You think it's far-fetched to do that? Because they did. They, they were in 100-pound bags. They moved 20 tons in 100-pound bags onto it. Uh, they, they said that they were moving it in these kind of duffel bags and suitcases onto the vessel at multiple points. They weren't stowed in the containers initially. In other words, you didn't bring a container on loaded with this. They brought duffel bags and suitcases of stuff on board and then packed them into containers on the ship. And that was one of the big issues here was that they were doing it on the ship. While MSC says it has long taken security seriously, it concedes that the Guyane was a wake-up call. After the incident, the company would spend $100 million, no, not even close to the amount of cocaine on board, over five years on anti-smuggling security upgrades, it says it now uses guard patrols on vessels sailing along the west coast of South America, drug-sniffing dogs at high-risk ports, and remotely monitor cameras on its vessel. Earlier this year, Bozo, again, <laughs> you can't get better than that name, the chief, the chief operating officer helped arrange an industry-sponsored conference with the United Nations and the World Customs Organization to discuss ways to better tackle narcotics trafficking. And MSC has made one other big change, according to a person familiar with the internal decision-making, Montenegrin seafarers are no longer used on ships crossing the Panama Canal. Okay, not, not, a little bit of racial profiling there, but that's what they did. But this is Breaking Bad on an epic scale. I mean, you're talking about 20 tons of cocaine on a single vessel, the largest drug bust in U.S. history. Not world history, by the way, but just U.S. history. There were bigger ones. But it gives you an idea of the danger of the volume of cargo coming into the, the United States and the scale of it. It's an amazing, amazing story. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. You can do that by hitting the super thanks button below or by heading over to Patreon and becoming a patron of the page. Till our next video, this is Sal signing off.